Well, Kate, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. And I can't believe you memorized those things. I, and uh, and I, I am a little bit scared of what uh, my student, Sarah Olson, had to say. But we'll, we'll talk about that later. Yeah, OK. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about uh, how global environmental change, especially global climate change and land use change, looking at deforestation in the uh, tropics, how that can affect uh, disease emergence and resurgence. And um, you know, I, I didn't really pick today. Usually, when I work on climate change and give a presentation, I arrange for hot weather. But um, something didn't go right with the <laughs> forecast. But we're going to talk about that anyway. Um, this crowd at UC Davis is well aware of, of this diagram that comes from the Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine, um, their report on emerging microbial threats for the 21st century. And really what the uh, idea here is that when we think about what we've learned from the medical model uh, between microbial agents and human hosts, uh, there's a lot going on here, but that's only part of the picture. And that unless we understand the socio-political background and the context or genetic um, and biological susceptibility factors, that we're not going to have a real understanding of the underlying causes. And more challenging is the ecological factors that come into play when you think about uh, infectious disease dynamics. And of course, physical environmental factors like climate uh, is one in particular that I'm going to focus on. That really, when you think about infectious diseases, it's more than just the agent and humans. Uh, and in cor of course, being in a place with the number one ranked vet school for many decades, um, uh, the idea that it's not just humans and vectors, that it's really a matter of, of wildlife too, wildlife and domestic animals. And this is where the One Health model comes from. And that's why uh, I'm invited out here, thanks to the One Health uh, Center for Excellence uh, and the, the Wildlife Health Center here, um, Pat Conrad and Cheryl and Kate and, and others. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this uh, One Health Frontiers in One Health seminar series. So this is a, a slide I don't need to talk about in this crowd, but the idea that you all, all know that the majority of new emerging diseases in humans stem from interaction with animals. And so unless we understand wildlife, human interactions, and disease ecology in animals, uh, we're never going to uh, get to the uh, determinants and understand how to pre uh, pre prevent these diseases. The, the idea of links between ecosystems and human health uh, and well-being uh, is, is not a brand new issue. Uh, the idea of ecosystem services, how intact ecosystems provide services for human health and, and societal well-being, is something we've known ever since, um, uh, ever since bakers in New York City realized they couldn't make bagels when they retired and moved to Florida. Does anyone know that story? So where, where are the best bagels in, in the country? New York City, right? Does anyone know why the bagels in New York are so good? Water. Water, right. They, they had the foresight to uh, protect the Catskills watershed. And uh, they pr protected it from development. And so New York City gets this pristine water from the Catskills. They don't have these you know, chlorination facilities. And they, they get really good water. So when the bakers moved to Florida and they didn't have the good water, they couldn't make good bagels. So there's one ecosystem service as an example of an intact ecosystem providing clean water. So this whole idea of ecosystem services is not brand new, but it's now gaining some traction. This is um, just to tell you that this concept is reaching the highest levels. Um, I've been involved with a report uh, for the Executive Office of the President entitled um, uh, Sustaining Environmental Capital, Protecting Society and the Economy. And in this 
This is not out yet. This is um, in draft right now. It was supposed to re be released on Earth Day, but it's, um, it's, not, it's coming out soon. But this idea of, of how intact ecosystems can actually prevent disease is part of the story here. And it's being uh, promoted at high levels. Now, how many of you have not seen this graph? <laughs> You've all seen this graph. Um, this is looking at past and future climate. Uh, the idea here is you can reconstruct um, climate. You can go back. Um, this just goes back 1,000 years by uh, looking at ice core samples and tree ring cores and ice and uh, coral reef core boring. And you can reconstruct climate back uh, actually 900,000 years. This only goes back 1,000 years and shows that we're, uh, except for today, we are, uh, except for May 16th, we are uh, on average um, above two standard de deviations of any temperature we've had in the last 1,000 years. And the projection is for rapid warming. Now, I'm not the climatologist, but this is what uh, the climatologists have been uh, showing us and for any of you that work in disease um, ecology and, and infectious disease modeling, you understand that uh, that could be quite problematic. Uh, ha have we really seen a change uh, globally? Well, this is um, an image of the North Pole, the Arctic sea ice coverage at the end of summer in 1980. And this is the end of summer in 2007. Now, I could stop right here, but I know I'm, uh, this is a very smart audience. So I do want to make sure that I tell you this is not just cherry picking one hot year, because that large extent of ice melt, you know, about half the United States, is part of a trend. This is looking at um, um, sort of worst case scenarios of how uh, fast the Arctic will melt. This is from 1900 to 2100, showing uh, you know when the, uh, the ice will melt. That's the worst case scenario. This is best case scenario. But of course, what's the red line? That's reality. The red line is the observed uh, speed of melting. And you can see that the observed melting rate is worse than worst case scenario. So this is when the climate community said, hang on, we're really we're really seeing a response to global warming and uh, got people worried. And especially, you know, you saw uh, covers like this um, to be worried about climate change and the poor polar bear is going to go extinct as it loses its hunting grounds. But one of the subtitles was How It Threatens Your Health. And this is the subject of the first uh, part of this lecture on the health effects of climate change. And if you think about uh, the physical attributes of climate change, these, these three issues of rising temperatures, sea level rise, mostly from thermo expansion of salt water. Forget about whether or not Greenland uh, melts and goes in the ocean. If that happens, we're talking about 20 feet of sea level rise. But this, the United Nations is very conservative on this. And the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, is only looking at sea level rise from warmer salt water, thermal expansion of salt water, and that's about a half a meter sea level rise. The other uh, physical issue with climate change, it's not just warmer temperatures, it's extremes of the water cycle, the hydrologic extremes. Uh, does anyone, well, I don't know about California, but when do you get your heaviest thunderstorms here? What, what month? <coughs> January, February? All right, well then forget it. Never mind. Where I come from, our, our heaviest thunderstorms are in the hottest month, uh, July, August, because hot air holds more moisture. So you can, you know, the hot air evaporates soil moisture and you get droughts, but hot air holds more moisture. When it rains, it can rain really hard. That's why extremes at either end, extremes of the water cycle. So this can uh, affect all sorts of different health outcomes. People die in heat waves. And if you've got sprawling asphalt concrete cities that are, have these heat retaining surfaces, you have the urban heat island effect. Um, ground level smog ozone pollution is very temperature, temperature sensitive. And so is ragweed pollen. Ragweed plants 
are temperature sensitive. Uh, I'm going to talk mostly for this crowd about the infectious diseases, uh, mostly vector-borne or insect rodent-borne diseases, and waterborne diseases. And of course, um, food and, and uh, water are the foundation of public health. So uh, water resources, food supplies, if we're, if we're thinking about droughts or floods, these could be quite, quite problematic. And on the bottom, the most difficult thing to study, you know, forced environmental migration from environmental disasters, people being forced to move. Um, environmental refugees, that, that prevents, presents a huge public health burden. Um, very hard to disentangle political situation from environmental situation, but um, that could be a huge issue. So we'll talk, uh, I'll go into a couple of these issues. Uh, this is a study that came out two years ago in, in the journal Science. Um, Roz Naylor and um, uh, Batisi um, up at the, she's at the Stanford and he is at the uh, University of Washington. Uh, they asked the question, uh, where will we see record temperatures for summertime? You know, where will we exceed um, record temperatures? And by the middle of this um, century, Everything in orange or red has a 70% chance or greater probability of having record, a record um, temperature for the summertime. And by the end of the century, everything in red, greater than 90% probability of having extreme summer temperatures. Now, that has a lot of implications for food supplies. And today, we have 800 million people already food insecure. This number, according to this model, would double because of crop failures um, by the middle of the century, which is not that far away. So this is one model looking at you know, issues with hunger and malnutrition. But for those of you who are working in One Health and zoonotic diseases, um, this slide, um, which comes from that, that wonderful book of ours that, you, that you've got, Kate, I'm sure you have this page marked uh, with this model. Uh, this diagram that shows what are the diseases most sensitive to climate or ecological, basically environmental change. Uh, is, it, is it diseases that go from human to human, uh, from one 98.6 degree environment to another 98.6 degree environment? There's not a lot of environmental influence there. So directly transmitted anthroponoses, human to human, that doesn't have a lot of environmental influence. Um, maybe um, you know some zoonoses where, uh, like rabies, animals, animals. Uh, there's some environmental influence. Actually, there is, but but as far as being affected by climate, there's not so much. It's these indirectly transmitted, the vector-borne diseases, where you've got, you know, outside of the humans, you've got um, vector res vector. Um, agents like a mosquito uh, or a tick um, where there's more sensitivity to the environment. And if you've got an indirectly transmitted uh, zoonotic disease, so a vector-borne zoonotic disease like West Nile virus, uh, Lyme disease, you know, these involve climate and landscape. It gets very environmentally sensitive. So the, all the things that you guys are studying in the vet school and in the One Health Center for Excellence, those are the most sen uh, environmentally sensitive diseases. So what's the difference between you and a mosquito? Besides that you can't fly, and I'm just looking around the room and I don't think any of you suck blood much. <laughs> Maybe Bill Ryzen, I don't know. <laughs> We're warm-blooded, and mosquitoes are cold-blooded. Exactly. What's your name? Jenna. Jenna. OK. Yeah. All right. OK. <laughs> OK. So um, what does this mean? Cold-blooded mosquitoes, whatever the air temperature is around that mosquito, that's its body temperature. What if that mosquito is harboring malaria parasites, or dengue fever virus, or West Nile virus? You know, the air temperature has a direct influence on the speed of development of the parasite 
virus or protozoa, whatever it is, in that mosquito. And this is a, a graph that we know very well. Um, and Shirley, correct me if I'm wrong on this one, okay? But this is look, this, the, the life cycle inside the mosquito, the extrinsic incubation period. And this is for two of the main parasites that cause malaria in humans, Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium falciparum. And notice, um, what do these lines do when it gets, this is temperature, and the number of days that it takes the parasite to develop inside the mosquito, these days are indicating when that mosquito draws up, let's say I have malaria, it draws up my blood, the, the parasite crosses the mosquito stomach lining and develops into a, an effective sporozoite stage in the salivary glands so that the next time she bites another person, she passes malaria, transmits the disease. That's all time dependent. And the time that it takes to develop for, for that mosquito to become infectious is temperature sensitive. So at this end of the spectrum, you know, if it gets below, say, 16 or 17 degrees for vivax, how long will it take that parasite to develop? What happens to that line? Becomes asymptotic, flattens out, right? So how long will it take? Forever, right? <laughs> okay, so it'll take forever for that parasite to develop. In other words, you can't have development of malaria if it's too cold. It's just <coughs> biologically not suitable for this, this biological system. You cannot have malaria if you don't have enough warm degree days, you just can't have the disease. That's why malaria is a tropical disease. And of course, as the temperature increases, you know, it gets, the mosquitoes become infectious, infectious much more quickly. Now, the, the counter uh, force here is that if it gets really hot, mosquitoes don't survive as long. And, you know, there's this equation, a vectorial capacity equation, that, it takes into consideration biting rates and how many mosquitoes and how long they live and this development time. This is actually an exponential term in that equation. So this is very important. And so if you take a place like uh, Zimbabwe that has um, high altitude, it has a high highlands right in the middle of the country. And from what we know about this climate suitability for malaria transmission, and, and thinking about that extrinsic incubation graph, it's the, the high plateau where most of the big cities are. These are these cold green and blue colors uh, indicating low climate suitability for malaria. Uh, this is a model done by uh, Dr. Chris Ebai and her team, uh, where they looked at climate suitability for malaria today and in the future. So with baseline climate, you've got plenty of malaria down in the lowlands, but in the high plateau, low climate suitability for malaria. But what about 50 years from now? What will the climate be like? It will change so that, that high, those highlands where it's too cold becomes warm enough to support malaria. So this is where we're concerned that as climate changes, some of these tropical diseases may change in their distribution. And um, this is not to say that climate is everything. Um, you, you, need, you absolutely need the right climate to have malaria. Um, but drug resistance, po human population migration, vector control and infrastructure, all these things are extremely important. So whether or not, you know, if this was Mexico, for example, and uh, you're talking about a disease like dengue fever, you know, will climate force dengue to move up into the United States, that's a totally different story. You're de dealing with different economies. Um, you already have the mosquitoes in both places. So it's a, a place like this where it's one country, one, one infrastructure. The shift in disease moving up in the highlands, it could be a real scenario. Um, there have been some um, documented um, Diseases in, in domestic animals. This is a blue tongue virus where uh, Dr. Uh, David Rogers from Oxford University has been mapping, you know, these different strains of virus moving northward in, in Europe. And, and he's looked at time series of, of climate, of temperatures over Europe. And uh, I won't go into the details, but looking at various confounding factors, uh, he concluded that 
there was a probable climate influence of gradual warming pushing this disease uh, northward uh, up into in northern Europe. What about a disease here in the United States, West Nile virus? Um, how many of you are working on West Nile virus? Wait a minute, just you guys? Who's, okay, so you left your shop behind, huh? Okay, all right, well anyway, so those of you who are working on West Nile, you, you know that this is a disease that naturally cycles in, mos through mosquitoes and birds. So it's a, a zoonotic disease, this is natural cycle, and uh, horses and humans can become infected, get sick and die, uh, we are, but we are irrelevant to the life cycle as dead end hosts. But West Nile virus came in, into the United States in 1999. And it came into, the, into New York City, and then uh, because it's, it cycles in birds, it, was, uh, it sort of went down the coast, and then it, follow, it followed the uh, bird migratory pathways. So it sort of percolated for a few years. It came down here, I don't know when it hit Florida, maybe 2001 or so. And then 2002, it, it was raging up through the Midwest. And then not surprisingly, 2003 uh, hit the, the uh, Rockies. And then 2004, it hit California. Now, this migration, it, West Nile virus marching across the country, mostly from interacting with birds, uh, the bird migration, um, that was pretty much expected. But what, what wasn't expected uh, was the relationship to temperature. If you look back at uh, where we've had the biggest West Nile virus outbreaks, there's always been some sort of um, either a drought, drought conditions or heat wave, you see drought or heat wave or mild winter, you know, in every major outbreak. Now, in 1999, when West Nile came into New York City, that was the hottest July ever recorded in New York City. Did climate change have anything to do with West Nile coming to this country? Probably not. Had no, you know, the, the story is, uh, uh, I think the genetics show, track West Nile virus back to the Middle East and probably an infected bird, Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, an uh, infected uh, mosquito or bird on a plane landed in New York. But the question is, the, were the conditions in New York with, very, with record temperatures in July, did that help West Nile grab a foothold in, on this continent? Um, and I'll let Bill Risen and his team answer that question. I don't know the story, but it's a, a story of international transportation bringing the virus but it seems like temperatures have something to do with it. And uh, Professor Risen's uh, work showed that the, the strain of West Nile virus in the United States, different from other strains of West Nile around the world, actually required warmer temperature than other strains. And even though I showed you the map of the bird migration and the, the West Nile in the east and the Midwest and it kept moving across, Within those expected um, regions of the country, uh, Dr. Risen found that during those epidemic summers, that there were, there were hot spots. And these hot spots of transmission were linked to above average temperatures. Um, this is um, from uh, his paper showing that, you know, in, in the Midwest, uh, when, you, when you had it through the Midwest, there were places where there was more transmission. It happened to be hotter than average there. And the same in, in 2003, you know, th it was super hot. I was actually doing a mini sabbatical in Colorado and it was, it was the hottest summer, it was miserable. But that hot spot was where he had the most transmission and in California, the same thing. So even though um, this is about international travel that brought West Nile here, it's about uh, wildlife uh, behavior and bird migration that's the main driver for West Nile, there is also an exacerbating, maybe a synergistic effect of hot temperatures. And, and Bill, your, Bill Risen is coming out with a new paper, or is it already out with your temperature even further validating the strength of a temperature relationship? Maybe I shouldn't have said that. I've just spilled the beans. 
Is anyone from the uh, newspaper here? Just forget what I just said, OK? So we're talking a lot about temperature. Um, are, are there any climatologists in the room? Oh, good. All right, I can say anything then. So um, the climatologists say, stop calling it global warming. It's, it's not just about temperatures. It's extremes of the water cycle. So it's, it's flooding. It's droughts. That's part of the story. And here's a beautiful image of Niagara Falls. How many of you have been to Niagara Falls? OK. Wow, that's a lot for California. Wow. Um, so this is a beautiful picture of Niagara Falls. But I'm going to ruin the image right now, because that is uh, up there just to show you that the amount of sewage contaminated stormwater that overflows in this country every year is over a trillion gallons, which would keep Niagara Falls running for 18 days. That's how much, that's how poorly our developed country handles heavy rainfall and runoff. Our, our systems, we, we, a lot of our systems combine stormwater runoff with sewage. And then it just, you get too much water. If it rains too hard, guess what? We're going we're gonna to overflow that. And we know we're going to overflow it. But it's gonna, we can't handle that much water. We already have this problem um, all over the country with our current level of, of uh, climate, uh, rainfall variability. Uh, we conducted a study looking at all reported waterborne disease outbreaks from 1948 to 1994 and found that two thirds, 67%, were preceded by extremely heavy rainfall uh, months. So in the upper 80th percentile, and more than half in the upper 90th percentile. So we concluded that heavy rainfall is a risk for waterborne diseases, and this controlled for engineering failures and other, this was not recreational exposures, drinking water outbreaks. Well, this is a depressing slide. This is actually a very important graph. So um, just take a look at this for a second. And it's hard to understand. But um, this is showing the nature of rainfall. What type of rainfall is to be expected? And this is. The uh, global average, on, on average around the globe, average events, average rainfall events, you know, a quarter, a quarter of an inch a day or something like that, they're not going to change much. The light rain, very light drizzle will go down. It's a very heavy precipitation events that are projected to go up. Extremes of the water cycle, more droughts, but more floods, more heavier rainfall. That's the, that's the signature of climate change. Uh, this is uh, the Milwaukee, the city of Milwaukee Bay after a heavy rainfall event. You know, all that sediment that flushes out from the rivers into the harbor, uh, where actually the drinking intake, the drinking water intake is out there, further out, don't worry. But uh, there was a, a huge um, um, cryptosporidiosis outbreak in 1993 uh, that we actually, in our analysis, was preceded by the heaviest rainfall month in the 50 year climate record that we studied. But since that outbreak, they've moved their water intake way out in Lake Michigan. But, but is this a dangerous uh, thing? Well, uh, our, our collaborator, Dr. McClellan, at the University of, of uh, Wisconsin in Milwaukee, goes out in a, a research vessel and samples the water every time there's a heavy rainfall event. And these, um, this is a, supposed to be a flaming hot uh, you can't really see those numbers. This is uh, 10 to 20,000 um, counts of, of, of E. coli you know, indicating contamination. So these flaming blue hot dots, you can see them here. You can see them on this beach. And the red hot dots, that's about up to 10,000, up to almost 10,000 counts of E. coli right in here. But only 60 or 70 of them carry malaria. And only a couple uh, of species can carry uh, both of the parasites. And the main uh, actor down there is Anopheles darlingi. So we're specifically looking for that species. And what we found was that the biting rates and the abundance of this mosquito, uh, it was very, we didn't find many of the mosquitoes in the forested sites. Uh, but in the deforested sites, we found a lot of these mosquitoes after controlling for human population. 
We sampled in abandoned agricultural fields that were completely deforested, no people anywhere, and we found this mosquito. So we found that uh, we think that there's a habitat influence, that, that deforesting can really affect this mosquito. But we wanted to not only catch the adults, but ask the question, well, can we find mosquito larvae? Because mosquito larvae, they, you know, they spend their lives in pools of water. So um, my graduate student and her team, they were, took her machete, she took her machete and bushwhacked through the jungle, sampling uh, over 1,000 bodies of water that were encountered five times. And, and, and every, this is you know, indicating um, like a deforested area where we, we captured adult mosquitoes. And then she um, bushwhacked through the jungle a kilometer on each side, transect, cat, you know, dipping for mosquito larvae. And this is a village site. That's a secondary forest site. And that's a relatively undisturbed site. And to ask the question, do we find that mosquito larvae um, in disturbed places versus in pristine places? That's one of her team members. Bottom line is that in places without this dangerous mosquito species, they tended to be more forested. Where when we, we where we found the mosquito, you saw you know a lot more um, shrubland and, and disturbed um, disturbed land. So in conclusion, what we know from this case study is that. Um, Deforestation is associated with mosquito abundance, the, the dangerous one, Anopheles darlingi mosquito abundance. Uh, and we've subsequently, uh, through uh, Sarah Olson, who Kate, Kate mentioned, my other student, Sarah Olson, uh, who is now working on the PREDICT project with, with UC Davis and um, Wildlife Conservation Society. Uh, Sarah Olson did a human epidemiology study in a county, a municipio, or county in Brazil, and found a correlation between a history of deforestation and an, an increase in malaria. So we now have a human epidemiology side, an association between deforestation and human cases, and the entomological <coughs> risk factor of disturbing the habitat and creating a risk for malaria. So we know this relationship. But what we don't know is the ecological mechanism. We don't know why we see this correlation. So the next steps are really to try to get at the mechanism by uh, designing an adaptive field campaign, field studies that are supported by um, real-time spatial analysis of land use and land cover change. And really, um, this introduces Part two of this talk, which is only going to be another eight or, set, or nine minutes, don't worry. But um, my first step in attacking this uh, mechanism question is to um, hire a smart young scientist to work with me. And uh, I found that person in uh, Dr. Nico Preston, who um, is going to show you our next steps here. So don't, so hold your applause because. We're tag teaming this. And I'm going to introduce you Dr. Nico Preston. He has a PhD in ecology uh, and has been, has been working on this healthscapes project to see if we can accelerate discovery and figure out all these environmental drivers and really put them together and, and use uh, the computer age to deal with massive amounts of data and satellite images so that we can figure out the problem uh, before the forest disappears. So, um, Nico? Well, thank you, Jonathan. Thanks for having us here today. It's been a fantastic morning of meetings already. Um, I'm going to give you a lightning talk here on healthscapes. And it's only appropriate because the reason we're developing it is because of the sense of urgency. Um, so this is a collaboration among ourselves, um, uh, the Sahana Eden Disaster Management Platform, and the National Ocean Atmosphere Administration, who's developing an integrated uh, disaster risk system uh, using similar methods and a similar platform. Um, and so one important thing to take from this slide is, uh, thank you, uh, just to uh, grab my email address. If this along the way sounds like something you're interested in doing, uh, we really need folks to work with us on this platform. We're just building the infrastructure. Uh, we need some help developing the science. 
So in a nutshell, what we're developing is a suite of web tools, uh, the goal being to analyze, find, and share uh, research data. The need for this platform is principally driven by urgency. So on one hand, uh, there's lots of good science being done. Uh, on the other hand, habitat is being altered at a rate that we need to accelerate the pace at which we're doing this research. There are a lot of interesting web tools coming out of uh, both commercial sectors, industry, uh, universities, et cetera, that we think can help catalyze uh, the speed of discovery. Um, among it all is well, a flood both, uh, both, uh, in both senses. One is a flood of data with increased sensors uh, and sampling approaches and imagery. We're dealing with an abundance of data. And uh, there's an opportunity to look to uh, the IT sector for tools for dealing with big data. Uh, similarly, uh, in terms of disaster and flood, a lot of this change has been accompanied by uh, arguably a higher frequency of, of disaster. So we've been working with the disaster management community who uh, really don't have time to, um, to deal with formatting issues and other problems we often encounter in the scientific process. And so we've been taking our cue from them on how to do these things more quickly and how to iterate between sort of headquarters and the field. There's also a demand for transparency. So. Uh, our community was stung a little by uh, scrutiny, public scrutiny about our methods and approaches. And arguably, a more open approach would benefit everybody. Uh, there's a lot of uh, compelling reasons to work with what resembles a more open workflow, building on the work of each other, and uh, not reproducing the same uh, code snippets, et cetera, in each laboratory around the country. Among this urgency, there's also opportunity. So, Computing is slowly transitioning to lightweight clients. Uh, just last week, uh, uh, Google announced uh, their Chrome-based laptops. You can do a lot with just a connection to the web. And we want to leverage this to put more computing power in the hands of our partners in developing countries, but also uh, resource-limited labs around the country, uh, or just globally um, getting things in the same space so people can have a lightweight client across machines to interact and collaborate with each other. One of the first challenges in finding this type of data is finding this type of data. The search engines largely target connections between websites. So if, for example, you're a malaria researcher and you need a base map, putting Amazon deforestation you know, file type shape file could yield anything. Um, it's a real challenge to find data that's relevant, that's current, uh, and incorporate it into your analysis. In fact, finding the right base map data is arguably a bigger challenge than actually using it. And this is something being faced by the web development community. Um, one approach we're taking is that instead of looking at the connections among websites to recommend resources, we're looking to the scientific literature. So we've been ingesting massive amounts of data, big data, um, and running large distributed compute uh, processes to mine the data for connections between concepts. The reason we're doing this is if someone came to our site and was interested in malaria, we'd like to recommend a couple of maps they could get started with. So here we're leveraging that, that, that approach that makes you buy more stuff than you intended to buy on Amazon.com. Hey, people who like this book also like this book. If you like this map, your colleagues also like that map. So we're trying to leverage that mentality to connect researchers more quickly with relevant resources. Here we're talking about maps. We're using similar things for recommending code, results, analyses, tools, methods. Um, analyzing your data. We've got a challenge of a black box in our discipline. Um, a lot of software one might like to use, you're not going to be able to buy off the shelf at Best Buy. So people are developing their own tools. Um, we're running into problems sharing those tools. The same tools are being developed in the same labs. And some of the commercial offerings are so restrictive that you can't run your own analysis 10 years later. Or you pay a license fee to teach a method you developed. So in that sense, we're intrigued by the potential of a more open uh, workflow. Um, and pulling a quote from computational linguistics, uh, indeed, I think the scientific community is going to move towards analyses having to be as reproducible as your information management strategy. So when you say, we're going to manage our data this way in our proposal, well, we're going to manage our analysis this way and release our results. Um, so here's an example of, of how we envision someone in the field with their laptop interacting both with collective intelligence, so a community of people who have developed these scripts and these methods together, as well as a, a panel of experts who have donated best practices. Here's some old analyses we use and we've published. And really, they're just going to sit on a computer. So let's repurpose them in the community, as well as stuff we're drawing from the scientific literature with our data mining tools. So behind each of our maps, here we have an actual uh, deforestation map uh, uh, in the Amazon. Uh, 
we have the underlying code. So if you're so inclined and are interested in such matters, you could look at the assumptions that went into generating that map. The other element that intrigues us is that of collective intelligence. Particularly in public health, the advantage of having people on the ground uh, making casual observations can't be understated, whether for uh, identifying you know, a tiger mosquito or um, uh, reporting uh, an incidence of everyone sick around me, et cetera. We want to tap that knowledge, uh, both in terms of surveillance and raw science to incorporate um, uh, local expertise. Uh, indeed, government has recognized that knowledge is widely dispersed and through data.gov and other initiatives has been looking for ways that we can um, bring people into the dialogue. That person on Wikipedia with an eclectic interest in 18th century light bulbs we want them. We want that kind of knowledge. People have lots of time to spend and um, can contribute to the scientific dialogue. The process of, um, of sharing this information we think will lead to uh, a faster rate of discovery and building on the work of others. So sharing our uh, analyses and code once we've you know, established intellectual property, published, whatever the mechanism is. But there's a lot out there in the public domain that could be better organized and distributed and repurposed uh, as a cross-cutting tool to other uh, infectious diseases. Here's an example of our interface. We're releasing our alpha, uh, hopefully this week. We're on the road, so we're a little disrupted. But uh, we have a, a mapping interface. We've incorporated both Python and R programming languages. So any script you can run in those with any library, you can do on this. Um, and then we're using a mashup. So instead of having another silo of knowledge about infectious disease, we're ingesting data from sources like Wikipedia um, to create sort of a portal of knowledge about the topic. So the closing slide from me, and then I'll let Jonathan say one last comment, is this idea that as, as a field scientist working, for example, in, in the Amazon, it would be fantastic to have the power of a supercompute cloud back at the university where I could send a job back to run across 1,700 computers and process imagery um, in order to accelerate uh, the adaptive or uh, uh, sort of iterative research process. So I've modeled, I've designed my sampling protocol. Once I get to the ground, well, gee, it's a little different. How could I re reprocess my results and adapt accordingly? Uh, so increasing the dialogue between the lab and the field, um, but then also bringing in these additional data sources uh, and consulting with your institution and other experts. So snapshot of Hellscapes, please email me if you have more questions. Um, our interface isn't finished for getting in touch with us online. And I'll turn back over to Jonathan. Stay up, please stay up, because I only have two slides. Don't move. So, uh, anyway, that, I like that picture better. So, I just want to uh, wrap up by saying that a lot of this is very challenging work, uh, but there are some great opportunities when you think about the combination of things we're studying climate, uh, environment, uh, societal structure, uh, you know, and, and there are big challenges. And there are some great opportunities. Here's one, one example of where climate change uh, and deforestation and health all come together. There's something in the negotiations about climate change called RED, and that's reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation. So this is the idea that 20% of climate change comes from cutting the forest. They are, they are CO2 sinks absorbing CO2. So based on what we, I, I've shown you some, from some of our work about a link between malaria and deforestation, you know, here's an idea that, well, gosh, can we mitigate climate change by protecting the forest, which can also have a health benefit. And this is where uh, we in our center, uh, the S a Center for Sustainability and the Global Environment, and now we have a new Center uh, Institute for Global Health, uh, where we're really only going forward with, with many disciplines at the table. You know, we, we, we want to make sure that we're uh, optimizing our outcome. When we do a policy intervention, can we have three or four wins uh, versus one win and two losses? And so this is where we really need to be thinking across sectors, across disciplines. And with that, I will just remind you that uh, One Health is a, a movement that is trying to do that, to bring, you know, it's One Health is environment, uh, animals, and humans. Uh, and there's also, uh, parallel to One Health, is this uh, International Association for Ecology and Health uh, 
that published a journal, One Health, uh, uh, Eco Health, that we're hoping that One Health will then join us. And, and I, I invite all of you to um, the next biennial conference in Kunming, China. So mark your calendars for October 15th through 18th, 2012. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention, and we'll stick around for questions.